Democrat Wes Moore is the first black governor of Maryland. Governor Moore and I sat down recently to discuss the current political climate. Have a listen. Governor Wes Moore, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate this. Congratulations. You know, thank you. So we are 60 years outside of the march on Washington for jobs and freedom. And I can't help but think about the progress that we've made when I think about, obviously we saw the Civil Rights Act 1964, we saw end of Jim Crow legally, we saw Barack Obama, we saw, now we have Kamala Harris, Ketanji Brown Jackson, we have you. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the progress that we've made and how you've seen it or how you picture this progress over the past 60 years. You know, I, I remember uh, the, the morning of our inauguration where I was very, very intentional about how I wanted that day to play out, where we actually started the day down at the Annapolis docks. And we started the day down at the Annapolis docks because while it's beautiful, uh, it's also one of the oldest slave ports in the United States of America. And we started the day by doing a replaying ceremony down there. And then I, along with my lieutenant governor and my family, we and, and a couple hundred other people, we marched from the docks to the state house. Uh, a state house that is that is one of the oldest, that is the oldest operating state house in the country that was built by enslaved people. And it was there that I was sworn in as the 63rd governor of the state of Maryland. And I wanted to do it because there is a power in understanding the journey. And there is a power in understanding that progress has been made. It's been uneven. It's been choppy and it's been painful progress, but it's been progress and earned progress. I think the thing we also wanted to remind people and remember is that the progress cannot be also seen in individuals and seats and that type of thing where I was, yes, being sworn in as the first African-American governor in the history of the state of Maryland and only the third African-American governor elected in the history of the United States. But I was also very clear, but that's not the assignment, right? The assignment wasn't getting to the state house and being elected governor. The assignment wasn't making history. Uh, the assignment is the work that you can do once you're in the seat. And that's the focus that I think that we've all tried to keep when it comes to now that you have a moment, when the policies that in so many ways, in so many cases have both elevated and also diminished, how, when you actually have a chance to be in the seat, can you be very intentional about creating policies that can create long-term and sustainable economic growth? Yeah, and I want to touch on that briefly, that, that history of Maryland that you mentioned, because we know that there has been, um, in some ways, a, a bit of a, a brutal history with, with Black Americans in Maryland. And, and then, as you mentioned, you were the, the third Black governor only ever elected, the first in Maryland. What does that say about um, particularly the course of, of Maryland on this charting toward progress? Yeah. I mean, I think about for our state, I mean, Maryland is, uh, is the home of of Thurgood Marshall and Cab Calloway and Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. Uh, and it's also the home of, of, of redlining. It's also the home of discriminatory housing and transportation policies that, that have been some of the greatest wealth thefts that we have seen within our society. It's also, you know, it's, it's also the home of, of Antietam and some of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War. Our, our history is complicated. And it's a complicated history of a state and a complicated country when it comes to the issue of race relations and economic growth. Uh, the, the thing that I, I also know and why I feel that sense of power is, you know, inside my office, there's a picture of I, I keep a picture of Frederick Douglass and I position it specifically in my office where it actually looks like he's looking down at my desk. And I do it because as I'm sitting on my desk, I will look up at the picture and think about the decisions that I'm making. And it's almost like, a, what would he say about this moment? What would he say about the decisions that I'm about to that I'm about to make? And I think us being able to understand the shoulders that we're standing on, us being able to understand the moment that we find ourselves in and us being able to understand that 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 it's not just that history is judging us right now. The future is judging us. 
and is really thinking about, are we actually capturing a moment and making each and every day matter in the way that those who came before us did? And so I think that is both the, um, it's both a burden that we have in the state of Maryland that I know is not unique to the state of Maryland, but there are some unique qualities of the history of inequity in the state of Maryland. Yet at the same time, I think it is that that weight that actually creates the opportunity for us to be able to do some do some powerful things going forward. You know, I'm looking at we're here 60 years again. And even though we've had this progress, I think, as you mentioned, we're in a very I would say precarious moment at this time where we're seeing these successes, but at the same time, we're also, I think, watching a little bit of a battle play out right now, especially when it comes to our culture and black history and black culture and black figures. Um, You know, we're, we're seeing violence perpetuated against black Americans, both physically and politically at this point. We just recognize the the one year anniversary of the the shooting at the top supermarket while we're also watching book bannings around the nation and and, and predominantly GOP led areas what is this moment as as we're we're fighting for progress but also finding hindrance in other areas how do we reconcile with that I, I think we we have to reconcile by being very intentional about pushing back uh, you know our, our history is our strength Our history is our foundation. Our history is the thing that reminds us every single day that nothing is impossible. That no matter what it is that we are facing, you can look back at your history and understand both as a nation, but also for African-Americans and people of color and anyone who's been part of marginalized communities as a people, that the progress that has been made has been hard fought. And you might see dark days right now, but I can guarantee this, those who came before you, saw dark days too, and they persevered. And because they persevered, we're able to stand here in our presence. And I think the danger that we're seeing of the banning of history, the book bans, and I would say it's not even just what we're talking about when it comes to afternoons. It's not just the fact that we have districts now that are banning Beloved and banning the bluest eye and banning books against Hank Aaron. Right. It's, it's not just that. It's, it's when we're watching the banning of books about the Holocaust. Yeah. It's when we're watching students under investigation because they're writing book reports on, on, on Stonewall. It's, it's why we're, we're, we're cutting curriculum about Japanese internment camps. When you are doing that, it's not. And this, there's this excuse that's being made that, oh, we're doing it because we don't want students to feel discomfort or we don't want students to feel guilt. That's not true. It's not that. It's not that they don't want certain students feeling guilt. It's that they don't want all students feeling empowered. Because when you know your history, nothing intimidates you. I don't flinch. And I don't flinch because I know my history. I know where I come from. And I'm proud of where I come from. And that's why I approach the world in the way that I approach the world. And all we're simply asking is that for every single person, regardless of their background, regardless of their family lineage, regardless of who they are in their own skin, I want them to walk through life feeling empowered. I want them walking through life feeling welcomed. I want them walking through life feeling supported. And the best way you can do that is by making sure that they know the shoulders they are standing on. If you do that, Nothing is impossible. And so I think we have to be aggressive when it comes to this because this is, it's not just an, an, an it's not just anti-intellectual, right? It's past that. It's actually beginning to deteriorate the fundamental strength that we have in our communities that's gonna give us the power in order to move forward in a productive and a, and a consolidated way. You talk about being aggressive when we, we see some of these policies. What does that look like to you? Why well, I think it looks like a, a few different things. One is I think we have to be able to strengthen laws that prohibit this. Uh, it, it's, it's the reason that we you know, are not only looking at laws about things we can do to ban you know, this idea of, of book banning and censoring of history, but it's also the reason why I joined up with, uh, with, with, with eight other governors and went to the publishers and said, we need you all to push back against this as well. These publishers who are, are now in battles with elected officials about what of their content and what of their curriculum can people actually read, 
process, understand, and learn. The second though piece is, I think we need to make bigotry expensive. I think when you have states that are doing things like book banning, I think when you have states that are doing things like restricting a person's right to, to, to be able to have reproductive health, I think we need to make bigotry expensive. And so for businesses that are doing business in those states, for people that are try- choosing to do conferences in those states, for teachers who now are under investigation for educating their students, I say this, come to Maryland. Come to a state that welcomes you. Come to a state that actually embraces all people and aspects of its society. And for those who are choosing to restrict rights, for those who are choosing to restrict knowledge and restrict access to information, I think we need to make it very, we need to make their decisions very expensive because they will watch businesses, they will watch individuals, they will watch their citizens choose to go elsewhere, make bigotry expensive. One thing that I think about at this time as we're approaching the march, the history of the march. We think about one of the phrases that continuously comes up recently is is Martin Luther King's infamous, famous, iconic, legendary phrase about the moral arc of justice. It's long, but it bends toward justice. Mm -hmm. And where we are right now, what words, I know you recently spoke at Morehouse, what words would you give students right now as they're on that, that bend trying to push toward that justice that we heard MLK speak of? I would say the, the, the moral art does bend towards justice, but not because of inevitability. It's because of courage. It, it doesn't do it because, it doesn't do it because of gravity. Um, it doesn't do it because a next generation moves on. It does it because of courage. And that's the only thing it's ever done. You know, when you think about every single movement that has taken place, every single bit of progress that we have seen, there's one thing that's always tied to it. It's names of people, right? It's people who actually chose to make that progress happen. You can't understand whether we're talking about women's suffrage, whether we're talking about the civil rights movement, whether we're talking about uh, the love is love movement. There are names attached to it, names of heroes and, and, and sheroes, right? Of people who decided enough. And I am willing to give it all in order to make sure that our society can be better. And so I think that we do and we historically have seen this this moral arc bend towards justice. But it really is because people have been pulling it that way and not because people were waiting for it to turn. Because when we see people who just sit there and wait for history to happen, history has a very dangerous way of turning in a different type of direction. And so we've got to be active participants in our democracy. We've got to be active participants in our future because that's how progress actually happens. We're in a moment. We have always been in a moment and those moments lead to movements. Where is this movement for civil rights right now in your mind? I think the movement for civil rights is is, is really focusing and needs to focus on economics. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, we, we set as a North Star for both our campaign and now the North Star for, for the Moore Miller administration in the state of Maryland. Um, this is about work, wages, and wealth, right? And it's about all three. It's about how do we come up with foundational and functional ways for people to have access to work, that we're actually having an education system that's training people how not just to be employees, but how to be employers, that we're creating pathways for people to be able to enter into a workforce. And we don't think that a four-year college is the only way for people to be able to do so, that we want to have real ways of job training and job reskilling for people to be able to participate in a rapidly growing and evolving economy, that we want to make sure that people are getting paid fair wages for their work and gone should be the days when we have people who are working jobs, in some cases, multiple jobs, and still living at or below a poverty line. And we need to focus on wealth, generational wealth, the ability to pass something off to your children besides debt, the ability to own more than you owe, right? This idea that we want to create an ownership society because it's never going to simply be about how are we increasing income or addressing an income gap if you still have a massive wealth gap because that's what's lasting, that's what's sustainable. And so I think the next phase of what we're talking about, it really is about economics, it's about pathways to work, wages, and wealth. And I think that is the next crucible. 
And that's something that was important to Dr. King as well. He talked about starting the Poor People's Campaign. That's exactly right. Um, As we wrap up here, um, reflecting back, um, again, to, to what the, this march was about, what it symbolized. What are you reflecting on um, this year as we're approaching this anniversary? Uh, I'm, I'm reflecting on uh, not just the, uh, the courage of Dr. King uh, and the power and the, and the fact that people oftentimes celebrate his oratory. But the amazing thing about Dr. King is he was a person who had no patience for just talk. Right? That one, maybe one of the, one of the, 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 greatest, the greatest speakers of, of the century was probably also one of the most impatient. That it wasn't that he had no interest in hearing just hearing people talk about what they want to do. You actually had to go out there and do it. But I also reflect on the fact that while Dr. King is oftentimes the name that people remember, he wasn't alone. He was surrounded and he was protected, right? He was surrounded by a series of activists and leaders and family members and people in the ministry and government workers and teachers and nurses and people who all had the same common cause and who were all bought in to the same common vision. And so I, I think, uh, you know, in this moment, I'm, I'm thankful for the work of Dr. King. I'm thankful for the work uh, of many of the civil rights leaders, but I'm also thankful for the names we don't know and the people who pushed just as hard to make sure that that moral arc was actually bending in the right way. Governor Westmoreland, Maryland, thank you so much to be here reflecting on this anniversary with me today. Bless you, it's my pleasure. Thank you for your leadership. Thanks again to Governor Westmore of Maryland for chatting with me.